We are with you, Irit, and with Daria, dear friends of Alex and Malka, dear Professor George Klein, who so graciously agreed to present the Alex Kenan Memorial Lecture, members of the scientific family of Alex, members of the scientific technological community and leadership of the State of Israel, dear friends. We pay tribute to the memory of Alex. It is with profound sadness and deep grief that I strike this note in the Alex Kenan 
memorial session. We miss him. We shall start with a video prepared by the Academy which shows something. What Alex was. זה תענוג גדול מאוד לעסוק במדע, מאוד מאוד גדול, כן? ולנסות להבין משהו שאף אחד לא הבין לפניך, כן? ולגנוב סוד אחד קטן מאלוהים, זה אין דבר יותר טוב בחיים. ‫להמחיש את האווירה, ‫אני יכול לספר אנקדוטה, ‫שאחרי שהביטחון כבר נבחר, נבנה, ‫פנחס ספיר נהיה מנכ"ל ‫של משרד הביטחון. ‫אז הוא יום אחד, ‫אומרים לי שהוא רוצה ‫שאנחנו ניפגש עם בן גוריון, ‫מפני שיש לו תלונות כלפיי. ‫אז הייתה פגישה בקריאה ‫עם בן גוריון וספיר. ‫וספיר אומר, תראו, ‫הבן של קוצנוק, ‫הוא הכיר את אבא שלי. ‫אומר, הבן של קוצנוק הלך ‫והקים איזה מכון שם בנס ציונה. ‫אני לא מוצא שום אסמכתה ‫שמישהו החליט להקים את המכון הזה. ‫אני רוצה שתהיה ועדת חקירה, ‫שתחליט, כן? מי החליט, ‫מי החליט את זה, למה צריך את זה, ‫ואולי לא צריך את זה, ‫אפשר לסגור את זה. ‫אז בן גוריון אמר, אם... ‫אני לא חושב שצריך ועדת חקירה, ‫אבל אם אתה חושב שצריך, ‫אני אהיה יושב ראש. ‫בזה זה נגמר. ‫עכשיו, המועצה הלאומית ‫למחקר ופיתוח, ‫של 63-67, ‫בעצם היה הפורום הראשון ‫במדינת ישראל, ‫שחשב על בעיות מחקר ופיתוח ‫במדע, בקנה מידה לאומי. ‫והיו אלה אנשים שהאמינו אמונה שלמה ‫שמדע, מחקר וטכנולוגיה, ‫מדע ופיתוח, ‫יכולה לשנות את פני המדינה. ‫שאנחנו מסוגלים לתת ‫למדינה קטנה איזה מימד נוסף ש... ‫שאי אפשר לקבל אותו ‫בשום צורה אחרת. ‫זה קצת היה מבוסס ‫על ביטחון עצמי ‫שרכש את משרד הביטחון. ‫אבל אני, אני לא, לא יודע מתי פעם הראשונה ‫נתקלתי בעובדה שרוצים להקים אקדמיה, ‫אבל שמעתי את זה לראשונה ‫מפיו של אהרון קציר, ‫שאמר שהוא... ‫שצריך להקים אקדמיה, ‫וזה בית נולד אצלו, ‫זה אין שום ספק. <coughs> ‫הוא מצא שהוא מצא גברת תורמת ‫שבאופן עקרוני מוכנה לעזור בזה. ‫אומנם הרעיונות שלה היו קצת ‫יותר מופשטים, כלליים, ‫וכך הלאה, והיה קשה... ‫מי זאת? ‫הגברת בן ליר. ‫אני לא זוכר את השם הראשון שלה. ‫פולי. ‫-הגברת פולי בן ליר, ‫כן, דרך אגב, ‫שכתבה ספר גם כן, ‫שמתי שהוא כתבה. ‫והוא באופן קבוע נפגש איתה, ‫וניסה לשכנע אותה באמת ‫ללכת לכיוון זה, ‫ובסיכום של דבר הצליח בכך, כן? ‫לא הצליח מלא, ‫מפני שהוא בעצם רצה ‫את רוב הכסף שלה לאקדמיה. ‫היא עמדה על כך שנוסף לאקדמיה ‫יהיה מוסד אחר ‫שילך יותר בכיוונים שהיא מבינה ‫ומכירה, ‫ושגם, דרך אגב, ‫הושפע על ידי הבן שלה, אוסקר, ‫שרצה איזה think tank ‫שיפתור את בעיות העולם. ‫הייתה לי הרגשה של משבר רציני מאוד. ‫אני באתי לניו יורק ודיווחתי ל... ידידי פול מרקס שהיה אז, הוא קיבל על עצמו אז את נשיאות של סלון קטרינג בדיוק. עבדתי במעבדה שלו איתו ואמרתי לו, תראה, מה אפשר לעשות בשביל לעזור? הוא אומר, תראה, אני לא, לא יודע מה בדיוק אפשר לעשות, אבל אני יושב בהנהלה של קרן. הקרן מחפשת איך אפשר לעזור לישראל. בוא תסביר לקרן את המצוקה שלך. אז הלכתי ודיברתי עם מנהל הקרן שהיה אילי אבנס אז. ‫ואמרתי לו שאנחנו נמצאים ‫במצב של משבר. ‫אז הוא אומר, אם אתה אומר לי את זה, ‫אני לא יודע איך להגיד את זה לזה, ‫אז בוא, אני אזמין לך אצלך מחקר. ‫אני מוכן 
לעשות משהו כדי שתוכל לפנות חלק של זמנך, דיבר עם פול מרקס ואמר תן לו אני יודע יום בשבוע או משהו כזה חופשי מהמעבדה ושילך שיכתוב ויתעד כן, את המשבר מפני שאז אפשר יהיה להעמיד את זה לפני הקרן והוא אמר יותר מזה אל תגיד לי רק שרע תגיד לי מה צריך לעשות כדי שיהיה יותר טוב אז אני ישבתי שנה כמעט שמה וכתבתי את המאמר הזה Science and Israel's Future אז הוא אמר לי שלא כל אחד בקרן מבין שמדע זה דבר חשוב בשביל מדינה. אז החלק הראשון מתעסק בזה, כן, שצר... מידת החשיבות שיש למדע למדינת ישראל. פשוט אותו, אותה תורה ששיננתי וש... ושהלכתי וניסיתי למכור אותה למועצה הלאומית למחקר ופיתוח, ניסיתי למכור אותה כאן, לפני הפורום הזה. אז לקח לי שנה לכתוב את זה. הבאתי את זה לבורד שלהם. והצעתי להם להקים קרן. עכשיו אמרתי כדי שהקרן הזאת, הצעתי קרן שמורה, אבל אמרתי כדי שהקרן הזאת תהיה אפקטיבית בכלל, אז היה צריך מינימום של איזשהו מיליון דולר לשנה, אנחנו מדברים על שנת 85, כן? או משהו כדי שזה איזשהו אפקט. אחר כך התחלתי לבלבל להם את המוח, ואני לא בטוח שאני בעצמי האמנתי בזה, שיהיה לזה אפקט קטליטי, שאם גר, קרן רצינית, בעלת משקל, תתרום למדע הישראלי, אז אולי אחרים יתרמו, אולי ממשלת ישראל תתעורר, אולי יקרו דברים, אני אהיה לזה קטליטי, אני יודע מה אתה אומר. בלבלתי לנו את המוח בעניין הזה. בסוף ישבתי וכתבתי, ואני לא, לא כותב טוב וקשה לי לכתוב. גם את הרקע, הם רצו רקע של, ויש כאן קצת רקע של ההיסטוריה של המדע בארץ. ‫אחר כך החשיבות של המדע בשביל זה, ‫ואחר כך מה צריך לעשות. ‫ואני הצעתי להם להקים קרן. ‫אבל אני ראיתי שהאקדמיה ‫לא, לא בנויה לאיסוף של, של כספים. ‫ואז הצעתי, נידפתי שאני אני אתחיל לעסק את זה. ‫הייתה לי הרגשת אחריות ‫כלפי החברים שלי, הם פול מרקס. וג'וש לדלברג, שהם יצאו מאורם בשביל לקבל לנו חמישה מיליון, שלא נקבל את זה משם, אנחנו לא יכולים לקבל מצ'יק. אז התחלתי להיות אוסף כספים. On my old year. אני, לא, אני לא, לא בדיוק, אני תמיד ניסיתי להשיג כסף למחקר ממקורות שתפקידם, זה, זה כסגן נשיא באוניברסיטה, אבל לא עשיתי בשנור. אולי, אולי זה, לא יודע אם להגיד את זה ב, בשמחה או ביגון. ‫אבל אני אף פעם לא איבדתי ‫את העניין במדע, ‫ואף פעם לא איבדתי את המגע הישיר ‫עם אותם הדברים שאני בעצמי ‫חקרתי ותרמתי להם, ‫ואני ממשיך לעקוב אחריהם ‫עד היום הזה. ‫וכמה שניתן כן לבצע קצת מחקר, ‫אבל להגיד שאם אני צריך ‫לחשוב על החיים שלי ‫ולהגיד אם הייתי עוד פעם עושה את זה, ‫אני לא, אני לא יודע, אני לא, ‫מפני שהמחיר הוא גדול. אתה, זה תענוג גדול מאוד לעסוק במדע, מאוד מאוד גדול, כן? ולנסות להבין משהו שאף אחד לא הבין לפניך, כן? ולגנוב סוד אחד קטן מאלוהים, זה אין דבר יותר טוב בחיים. Mais puisque rien ne tue, on est loin, on est loin. And that was Alex. You know, in Hebrew, in a very formal occasion, we used to address a distinguished gathering by starting with the words, Moray Rabotai, my teachers and respected colleagues. Alex was indeed my teacher and senior respected colleague, with whom I learned two major things. I learned what are the deep obligation of an Israeli scientist to the state of Israel. And I was guided by him in the fascinating, central, and important world of science policy on the nation and the international.
I will call on Yiri. Thank you, Joshua. It's, um, it's a rather odd task um, to speak as a daughter, and not one that I'm particularly used to. And, um, and this, this was suggested sort of, of rather late in, in the day, and so I don't have anything prepared. But um, one of the things that, that I, was, I was thinking of, Alex was a lovely man. Um, he was immensely curious and endlessly interested in anything and everything that crossed his path. And, um, and though he wasn't um, hugely schooled in the ways of parenting, um, he was an extraordinary mentor. And um, two weeks ago, when the first year anniversary of his death came on the 6th of May, um, I was in Helsinki and my sister Daria was in New York and we were sort of sitting and talking on the phone. And um, I said, what's, what's he saying to you? And she said, he's asking me whether I've done anything exciting and innovative this week. And I've been trying to come up with the kind of answers that would satisfy him. And then she said, what's he saying to you? And I said, because I was in the middle of, of some very complicated decisions, I said, he's saying, stop and think. Don't make impulsive decisions. Stop and think about what you're doing. The implications aren't just for you. They're for you know, a whole field of activities. And I think that one of the things that, oddly enough, as a daughter, I, I appreciated was that Alex was somebody who introduced me, and I think a lot of other people, to a kind of recognition that ambivalence and the kind of, of dual perspective on things was immensely important and productive. And I think that um, this lovely occasion, which is full of people that he both loved and respected and loved working with, is one of those instances um, in which he was, it was, it was the, the, the question of centers of research excellence was really the, the last issue with which his mind was preoccupied in the last year of his life. And uh, because I, I had the, the, the pleasure of spending that last year with him, um, what was so interesting was that on the one hand, as Joshua said, at, at a national level, he thought of it as a kind of important step ahead for science and for scholarship in Israel. But at the level of the individual intellectual, he was also full of doubt and full of questions about the very notion of excellence. And sort of over those last nine months, we rehearsed both the pros and the cons. And so I'm really very glad to be able to, to catch at least one day of this symposium because I feel that you know, I, was, I was part of the, the preparatory talks. I think that he is very present here, uh, not just because of all the, the sort of, of legacies of, of thought and action and reflection um, that he left for us, but also because he loved working with other people. He thought knowledge production can only come in, in collaboration. And, the, the, and I think one of his greatest pleasures was to be able to persuade and enthuse somebody to um, ideas that they might not have been aware of before. And so the, the, the possibility of having his last preoccupation shared among such a group of friends and colleagues and students um, and as he would have said, co-conspirators. Um, it would have, would have given him immense pleasure, I think is giving him immense pleasure, and um, to us by proxy for him. So thank you to the Academy for organizing this. He had a great affection for the Academy. It was his last sort of intellectual and, and um, scientific or policy home. 
uh, in a really long life of, of, of many activities. And he had, um, he had an affection for it as a potential force for good in the landscape of Israeli knowledge production, but he also had an, a, a huge affection for the family of people that had grown together here. Um, for the intimacy, because it was maybe the sort of smallest and most intimate place that he had worked in. For the friendship, for the sense of, of shared commitment. And so in, in every aspect, I think, um, He's enjoying these two days greatly. So thank you all for being here, from my sister Daria and myself, and um, for the pleasure of thinking collectively. Uh, it is hard to uh, imagine that already a year has passed <coughs> since uh, Alex uh, has left us. Uh, we have been so used to see him here in the academy uh, almost on a daily basis. Uh, in the last few months uh, before his demise, uh, he wasn't able to come to the academy, but all of us came to him like a pilgrimage in order to consult with him on various aspects, on various questions that he dealt with during several decades that he was here at the academy and it was very important for us to hear his opinion because uh, his opinion was always very relevant and very helpful for whatever we did. For several decades he served as a, a special advisor to the president of the academy dealing with many issues most of them I mean this was with, with several presidents of the academy. And uh, he always dealt and in, in, uh, uh, invested efforts in uh, problems and issues that were related to uh, science policy and to the advancement of science in Israel. I think that this was for him the most important issue. Uh, for this purpose, uh, he was very active in establishment of the Israel Science Foundation uh, at the beginning. Uh, he was instrumental in establishing the Batsheva uh, Rothschild uh, Fund for support of research in Israel. Both he and Malka played a, an unbelievable role uh, in keeping this uh, fund going for many, many, for decades and it is active until today, but unfortunately uh, without Alex. So uh, I think that advancement of science and science policy actually drove him all his life for being active in so many aspects of the scientific life in Israel. Uh, I became more closer to him uh, during the two years that we were involved in a committee that uh, dealt with the state of the biomedical research in, uh, in Israel. Uh, biomedical research and particularly clinical research in Israel uh, was, uh, we saw it as a problematic issue because uh, when we look at all kind of uh, bibliometrical parameters, the level of Israel, which is very high in many disciplines, in clinical, uh, clinical research was not so flattering. And we asked people working in clinical research, what is missing? What do you need in order to advance the situation? And uh, we tried then <coughs> to uh, prepare a report that will deal with this issue in order to improve the situation. Alex was a, a, a really rock of stability and he carried on the activity of this, uh, of, of this uh, committee and was instrumental in preparing the report and afterwards not only preparing the report but pushing that the uh, recommendations that are included in the report will be indeed uh, implemented. Uh, this was Alex planning things and then pushing to ensure that what was planned will uh, become a reality. 
Uh, we miss him very much. Uh, I, whenever I go in the corridor near his room, I, and I see Shelley there, who, who was his secretary, it almost, you know, uh, I almost feel like going in and seeing Alex and asking him another question. So I'm, uh, I hope that in uh, uh, these two days, by remembering him, remembering him and his legacy, uh, I think we are doing not more for ourselves than we are doing for Alex. But I hope that in spirit he is with us. Thank you. Dan Tulkovsky is an old friend of Alex. I remember many encounters, many conversations and discussions in the house of Alex and Malka and in other places. Yeah. I can only add a postscript to all that's been said about Alex today, and in particular, you heard from him directly on the screen, which was Alex all over. Alex was a unique personality. His knowledge of science his deep and broad knowledge of science, well beyond the main thrust of his own activities, was unusual. He was not only a, a first-class thinker, but he was a, a catalyst, an initiator and catalyst of projects. He planned them. He knew how to persuade people to take part in them and he knew how to bring them to a conclusion. I met him originally in the 1950s when he was in the defense establishment, but I really got to know him uh, later on in the 60s in the National Council for Research and Development. Uh, he was the initiator, the leader, the chairman. Uh, he asked me to join, and I must say the discussions, most unusual for Israel, were always quiet, very interesting, um, nothing extreme about them. He could, he was a great listener. He listened with patience and tolerance to people's views. He was always prepared to listen to people. I really admired him in every sense of the word. When they moved, when Malka and uh, Alex moved to Tel Aviv, we developed a very close friendship with them. It was uh, very, very gratifying in every sense. They were a very unusual cu couple, charming, cultured, worldly wise. It was always a pleasure to meet them, listen to them, talk to them. It was a, it's a, a long, quite a long relationship, and it's very sad, it was very sad that it ended the way it did, but um, Alex fought on to the bitter end, and um, it's something we shall always cherish, my wife and I. Uh, following the moving words of Dan, the long, and most important way of Alex in the on the road of national science policy started in the kitchen in the house of David Ben Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel. There, Alex, as a young scientist, established the Institute for Biological Research, which was truly a central in contribution to the perpetuation of the qualitative advantage the state of Israel, and that was under the leadership of Alex. Let me call another close person, Jesse Osman. Jesse, please. Thank you, President Arnon, President Jordner. The, the title of my remarks is uh, The Germination of Alexander Canaan. 
the subject, one might say the object, of Alex Kanon's life was germination. Alex worked a great deal on the Bacillus subtilis, the hay or grass bacillus. Bacillus subtilis has the ability to form a tough protective endospore, allowing the organism to tolerate extreme environmental conditions, including cooking. Such spores remain dormant for years, indeed for centuries. Unlike several well-known closely related species, Bacillus subtilis causes disease only in severely immune compromised patients and conversely serves as a probiotic in healthy individuals. Sol soldiers used it during World War II to counteract dysentery, as Bedouins had done since ever. It's a characteristically Levantine organism. Bacillus subtilis was Alex's favorite model organism. Probiotics have become a popular notion but Alex had chosen this as, a, as his favorite long before health food companies began to pepper us with ads for the multitude of friendly microorganisms that bring us benefits. The titles of some of Alex's most influential papers include Activation of Bacterial Endospores, Spore Structure and Its Relation to Resistance, Dormancy, and Germination, and Transformation of a Dormant Spore into a Vegetative Cell. These papers were co-authored with his many lifelong friends, including Cyrus Leventhal, Harlan Halverson, Woody Hastings, and Hans Kornberg. Alex was fascinated and tempted by dormancy, apparent metabolic inactivity. In Alex's view, dorm dormancy had two distinct meanings. Dormancy usually described the apparent metabolic inactivity of the spore stage as compared with the vegetative cell but it could also describe a spore suspension that responds poorly or not at all to germination, to germination agents under conditions that permit rapid germination of aged or heated, heat activated spores. This latter sense of unexploited potential, only needing an extra stimulus, especially fascinated Alex. It's noteworthy in the papers, in the experiments, that Alex would induce germination both through warmth and acid. <coughs> he preferred warmth which Alex and his extraordinary wife, Malka, generated so naturally. But when a bit of acid was required, he would apply it. To summarize his work as a microbiologist, Alex analyzed inhibitors of synthesis. I was introduced to Alex in 1989 by Joshua Letterberg, with whom he had been friends since about 1950 for meetings at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. I was directing a study funded by another close friend of Alex, David Hamburg, then president of Carnegie Corporation of New York, on the use of technical expertise by the US government, a vast desert of dormant spores. We wanted some views of US behavior from outside the US. Alex had long experience in cooperation with the US, bilaterally with Israel, trilaterally with Israel and Egypt, and multilaterally through the World Health Organization. During a sabbatical at Rockefeller University in 1990 in New York City, Alex wrote an insightful and diplomatic essay, almost 100 pages, titled The U.S. as a Partner in Scientific and Technical Cooperation, Some Perspectives from Across the Atlantic. Published in 1991, the essay documented many spores that the U.S. had neglected to germinate. Alex, who co-chaired the Committee for Scientific Cooperation between Israel and Egypt from 1979 to 1984, so he understood about political spores and dormancy. In fact, the subject of the history of scientists' roles in international conflict resolution became a great subject for the rest of Alex's life, neatly parallel to cryptobiosis. After the bombs of World War II, scientists became increasingly aware of their social responsibilities. Some scientists use their communication networks not only for cooperation in science, but also to reach across international lines of conflict in attempts to mitigate such conflicts. <coughs> Some of these activities are known and well documented. For instance, the activities of the international pugwash movement in which Alex had been involved almost from the outset. Many other activities of similar nature but smaller in scope or limited to regional activity were little known and less well documented. Scholars had not examined these activities and their, or their influence on international relations. Alex was aware of their inc increasing scope and concluded that they merited study. Their recognition might spring some out of their vegetative state. In 1995, Alex launched studies on scientific cooperation and conflict resolution, 
cultivated especially during summers at his beloved marine biological laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, where he had first worked on cryptogenesis back about 1960. In 1996, Carnegie Corporation supported a multi-year project under the auspices of the New York Academy of Sciences. The project began with case studies on particular conflicts, such as Israel and Egypt and U.S. and USSR, <coughs> institutions such as Pugwash, and natural science disciplines, such as seismology and microbiology. Most of the studies were conducted by scientists who themselves participated in attempts to use scientific cooperation for international conflict mitigation. There was a great conference in 1998 in New York, Scientific Cooperation State Conflict, the Role of Scientists in Mitigating International Discord. A volume was published, edited by Alex in 1998, with examinations of a range of issues and situations. It's also an essay co-authored with uh, Danny Shoham on scientific cooperation in agricultural and medical research as a means for normalizing relations between Israel and Egypt. The, the New York Academy project included a case study on Brazil and Argentina, but it emphasized U.S. experience and the Middle East. What about Europe, where Alex had been born? Mindful of omissions, together with the French historian of science, Jean-Jacques Salomon, another friend of Alex, another activated friend of Alex, uh, Jean-Jacques offered to convene a conference based on European experience, broadening the scope of scholarly networks also to disciplines such as economics and deepening the perspectives offered by political economy and other fields. There was another meeting, the impact of scientific cooperation between nations preventing and solving conflicts held in Paris, sponsored by NATO's scientific division and the Ministère Français des Affaires étrangères. The organizing committee included André Lebeau, who many of you may have known, founder of the European Space Agency, and Hugues de Juvenel, son of Bertrand de Juvenel, author of the classic On Power, The Natural History of Its Growth, written during World War II in occupied France. De Juvenel wrote that politics is the last repository of hope, that perhaps science is truly the last repository of hope. The result of the Paris Project was a volume on scientists' war and diplomacy, European perspectives, rich in history and nuance. Meanwhile, Alex continued his long interest in luminous bacteria. Luminescence had led him to the now burgeoning topic of quorum sensing. Quorum sensing is a system of stimulus and response correlated to the density of a population of bacteria and perhaps larger organisms too. Many kinds of bacteria use quorum sensing to coordinate gene expression depending on the density of their local population. Some social insects use quorum sensing to determine where to nest. Bacteria that use quorum sensing secrete signaling molecules, often pheromones. The bacteria also have a receptor that can detect the signaling molecule. When the inducer binds the receptor, it activates the transcription of certain genes, including those for inducer synthesis one bacterium is unlikely to encounter or detect its own secreted inducer. Thus, for gene transcription to be activated, the cell will likely have encountered signaling molecules secreted by other cells in its environment. If few of the cells, few of the bacteria are present, diffusion reduces the concentration of the inducer in the surrounding medium to near zero. So the bacteria, in turn, produce little inducer. As population rises, the concentration of the inducer passes a threshold and causes more inducer to be synthesized. The positive feedback loop can fully activate the receptor. Coordinated behavior of bacterial cells can, for instance, cause bioluminescence. The bright luciferase produced by Vibrio fisheri, fisheri would not be visible if it were produced by only a single cell. Quorum sensing implies cooperative behavior. Cooperative concepts tend to be challenged by their evolutionary implication, which favors the selfish. Alex had no problem seeing evolution as a balance of cooperative and selfish processes. The final paper he co-authored was titled, Quorum Sensing Influences Vibrio Harvii Growth Rates in a Manner Not Fully Accounted For by the Marker Effects of Bioluminescence in 2008 and PLOS One, with Josh Letterberg, Bonnie Bassler, and others. The paper has been viewed over 7,000 times healthy for a scientist who published his first paper almost 60 years earlier. The theme of Alex's long career was remarkably consistent from microbiology to macropolitics. He was concerned with inhibitors of germination. As we have heard these past two days, he was remarkably effective at overcoming these in inhibitions in the laboratory, 
in the careers of his colleagues, in universities and other research institutions, in science as a whole, in Israel, between nations in conflict. The consequence was the many careers, institutions, and programs he caused to germinate, and the remarkable network of the Friends of Alex. <coughs> many are here today, and I bring greetings from another dozen in the USA, including in alphabetical order, Gary Borisi, David Hamburg, Woody Hastings, Howard Hyatt, David Kirsch, Hans Kornberg, Marguerite Letterberg, Paul Marx, Rodney Nichols, and David Thaler. I'm sure the Revson and Rudin Foundations would also want to be mentioned. And if they were still with us, Josh Letterberg, Norton Zinder, and Harlan Halverson. At one time or another, Alex found all of us in an ametabolic state, and with lots of warmth, and occasionally just a little acid, brought us to life. May we, may we carry on his work of germination and the cooperative behavior he found so deeply rooted in biology. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jesse. Alex, you have really appreciated these words. Rachel Galun was an old friend and collaborator of Alex. And I would like to call him here. Alex was my mentor for the last 60 years. And I'm don't, I don't exaggerate when I say 60 years. Now, since he spoke to us in Hebrew, as my mentor, I'll speak to you in Hebrew too. So those that don't understand me will have to excuse me. What we've heard now about the wonderful things of Alex, and mainly from, I would say, from the last 30 years of the האחרונות. ואני הייתי רוצה לחזור לתרומותיו מלפני 60-65 שנה, משום שלמזלי זכיתי לחזות בהם וללמוד מהם. אלכס הקים את מה שקראו בזמנו חמד ב', ושבהמשכו הפך להיות המכון הביולוגי בנס ציונה. הוא עשה את זה כשהוא היה עדיין בשנות ה-20 שלו. בלי שום ניסיון מדעי פרט לזה שכבר היה לו דוקטורט ועם חבר אנשים מדענים שמרביתם אפילו לא גמרו עדיין תואר שני באוניברסיטה באותה תקופה לא היה תואר ראשון כלומר התואר השני הוא היה הראשון ואת האנשים האלה הוא היה צריך להנחות ולהדריך שיפתרו הרבה מאוד בעיות שמערכת הביטחון לא היו לה פותרים אחרים אלכס, העיקרון שלו היה שאין מחקר אפליקטיבי, שזה היה בעצם הפונקציה העיקרית של המכון, אין מחקר אפליקטיבי בלי שיעמוד מאחוריו מחקר בסיסי מעולה. ועל הנושא הזה היה צריך להשיג את התקציבים הנאותים, הוא נלחם כל זמן שהוא ניהל את המכון, לא בהרבה הבנה מצד שני, אבל בהצלחה, משום שהאנשים במכון הבינו את ה... את הגישה ואימצו אותה והדבר המעניין שאם אנחנו מסתכלים 15-20 שנה יותר מאוחר הרבה מהפרופסורים המוליכים במוסדות גם בירושלים וגם בתל אביב ובעיקר בתל אביב בבית ספר לרפואה הם חניכיו של אלכס מהמכון הביולוגי וזה רק הודות לגישה חכמה הוא נהג לשלוח אנשים צעירים מאוד לעשות דוקטורט במוסדות הכי טובים בעולם נהג לשלוח אותנו לכנסים בינלאומיים כשלא היה לנו עוד מושג מה זה ובאנו לשם תמימים לחלוטין <coughs> אבל הוא התמיד לעשות זאת וגידל דור של מדענים משמעותיים אלכס עזב את המכון הביולוגי כשכבר המכון היה עצמאי והלך לפתח מוסדות אחרים אבל שמענו הרבה על תרומתו במועצה הלאומית יותר מאוחר באוניברסיטה העברית <coughs> מכיוון שהיה אמן, אמן שאין כמוהו ביחסי אנוש מלווה בזה שהוא היה אנציקלופדיה מהלכת כך שלא משנה מה הייתה המומחיות של האיש או ההתעניינות שלו אלכס ידע לנהל איתו שיחה אינטליגנטית ונשיא האוניברסיטה אימץ אותו לסגן נשיא שיטפל בכל הדונרס ודברים כאלה הוא עשה את זה הרבה שנים בהצלחה מדהימה עד שהוא חשב, וכמו שראינו בקטע של הסרט, שהוא בכל זאת רוצה לעסוק קצת יותר במדע ולעזוב את האדמיניסטרציה. 
ואמר לו הנשיא, תשמע, אני אפסיק עם זה. אז הנשיא אמר לו, תשמע, אתה יכול להפסיק, אז לא יהיה לך מזכירה, לא יהיה לך משרד. אבל אני אשתמש ביכולות שלך לעשות את זה ממילא באותה מידה, כך שלא כל כך כדאי לך להפסיק את זה. דבר נוסף ש... שתרם הרבה, שנתרם בגלל יכולתו הנפלאה ביחסי אנוש, הייתה העובדה שהאוניברסיטה מינתה אותו לאחראי למחקרים משותפים עם שכנינו. ושוב, בשטח הזה נפגשנו רבות, משום ש... אני ניהלתי מחקר עם מצרים במשך 12 שנה, והוא היה מאוד בתמונה. ואני רק רוצה לספר על אינצידנט אחד שמראה את הכישרון הייחודי שלו. היה לנו יום אחד כינוס עם המצרים שהתקיים בארצות הברית, והיו מדענים ישראלים, מדענים מצרים, ודובר על פיתוחים של שיתוף פעולה. המצרים מסיבות פוליטיות רבים מהמדענים לא היה להם נוח שיתופי הפעולה ודי חיבלו בכינוס והגיעו למצב שהמסקנות של הכינוס היו ששיתוף פעולה הוא לא כל כך בריא. והמרכז האמריקאי רצה לסכם את הפגישה הזאת ככישלון. אבל אליקס הצביע ואמר תן לי רק להגיד כמה משפטים וקם ואמר ישבנו שבוע ודנו בכל מיני שיתופי פעולה בכמה מהם הייתה לנו הבנה, בהרבה מהם לא הייתה לנו הבנה, אבל ראינו שיש עוד הרבה מקום לדיונים בכדי שנוכל ליצור שיתוף פעולה. אז אין ספק שבשלב הפגישה הבאה, השנייה והשלישית, נקדם את הנושא ונבוא לידי פתרון קונסטרוקטיבי. כך שנאלץ המרכז לסכם את הפגישה הזאת כהצלחה ולא ככישלון. וזה היה אלכס. <laughs> הוא לא היה מוכן לקבל כישלונות. וידע גם דברים שלא התקדמו כמו שצריך לסכם אותם בצורה קונסטרוקטיבית ולתת תקווה, ולתת תקווה לעתיד. כמו שאמרתי, 60 שנה הלכנו יחד. אני חושבת שהתרומה שלו לקידום של הקריירה שלי הייתה ענקית, ואני לא יכולה אף רגע לשכוח אותו. בספר שכתבתי בביוגרפיה הרגשית שלי, שם מוקדש הרבה מאוד לזכרו. כמו שאני אומרת, כמנטור שלי שישים שנה. אני אזכור אותו לטוב, רק בתור איש יצירתי לה, להפליא. תודה. תודה. אני אומר את זה בהיברו ולא מתרגש לאנגלית. בשנת הזאת, באוגוסט, הביולוגיקל אינסטיטוט established by Alex Keenan, published its history. And the history book was devoted as a tribute to Alex. And the director of the institute wrote in a letter to the Keenan family, and I read that sentence in Hebrew and then translate, מנקודת מבטי היום כמנהל המכון ומתוך ידיעת העובדות אני רוצה להביע הערכתי העמוקה ביותר על חזונו ותרומתו של אלכס לביסוס המכון ועל תרומותיו הרבות האחרות למדינת ישראל. So the director of the institute said that from his point of view he wishes to express deep respect and admiration to the vision and contribution of Alex Kinan to the build-up of the Institute and for other contributions to the state of Israel. So I'm afraid it's a great year to hear that what you say. Hanoch Gutfran was a dear friend of Alex, a comrade in arms. They did many, many conduct many activities together. I really find it remarkable and moving that a daughter, a mature daughter, who has now her own standing on the arena of academic intellectual life, has her own worldview, refers to her father as a mentor. So did Rachel Galun.
And the first word that comes to my mind when I think about my relationship with Alex Kainan is that of a mentor. He was a mentor to all of us. And a mentor is an admired teacher. And what did he teach us? What did he show us? And it was said in so many words. And you cannot innovate much, but let me try to say that also in my own words. Actually, what he showed us, first and above all, that issues that science policy is not a simple matter. It's not something uh, that everybody can just uh, say something about it from his first impression, that it is something very serious, that it is a complex network of parameters, that there is an international context. There is a local, specific, particular a framework, and that kind of thinking he applied in every institution, in every context. Now, I would, the first time I met Alex was on the arena of the Hebrew University. And when I look back, there were great colleagues, some of my age, some a little older, there was Abe Harman, there was Dan Patenkin, there was Amnon Pazi, Yoram Ben Porat. They all implemented to the best of their intention, intelligence, ability, a kind of policy. They all looked up to Alex. Alex was also their mentor. And if I can add to that something uh, on his personality, Alex had a very warm and pleasant personality. He was very, a very intelligent man. The more I grow, the more I mature. And I look back at that and I see, I can sense in Alex some deep, roots of what to many of us is that classical European culture. Uh, Alex knew, was very familiar with the core of that kind of thinking, with the core of the classical art and literature. Once I mentioned to him that I met somebody, an old man in the United States, whom could recite by heart Heine and Goethe and Schiller. So Alex opened his mouth and started to recite by heart all of them, in Russian Anna Karenina, in German that. And it was so impressive, so rewarding to have Alex as a mentor. But I can say that uh, in later years, more and more as a friend. And that kind of relationship, that friendship, I shall always cherish. Lechavod li lazmin et Professor George Klein laset et arzales. The words that come to mind when I think of Alex is polite, but persistent, indomitable, and relentless determination to achieve what he believed in. <clears throat> A name that comes to my mind may sound strangely misplaced to you, but I will explain why I mention this name. And the name is Napoleon. Now, nobody could be more unlike Alex than Napoleon. But Napoleon was giving one single interview in his life. He normally did not grant interviews. 
But apparently, apparently this um, American female journalist somehow opened his heart and he spoke to her and she asked, are you a good general? She said, yes, I think I am a good general. So she said, explain to me why. So he said, because I can speak to people and I can make them follow me wherever I lead them. And the second reason is that if I have to predict sending elephants from Cairo to Paris, I can tell the day and the hour when they will arrive. He was a master of logistics. And I think both of these statements somehow apply to Alex Mutatis Mutandis. I was going to speak about creativity in science and poisons, of which Alex was very much more aware than you might think. <clears throat> when I was a gymnas in gymnasium in Budapest at the age of 13, the first Hungarian scientist to win the Nobel Prize for work done in Hungary, and ever since he's the only one who got it for work in Hungary, was Albert St. George, who discovered vitamin C. Uh, he was, by the way, a good friend of Hans Krebs, uh, who worked in Britain, and uh, St. George has been very much with him. And I quoted yesterday the statement of Krebs, saying that a creative environment is like an enzyme. It can work with great precision and very fast, but it is very susceptible to small doses of poison. When St. Yudhi came back to Budapest after his Nobel Prize, he was the most celebrated person in the country, and for a long time still he remained. And he was invited by the teachers of gymnasium at some anniversary to give them the speech of honor. And this speech, it rumored, we were not there to hear it, only the teachers were there. It was a major scandal. Actually, it was never printed but it was circulated in a sort of sum is that. Uh, fortunately, I got a copy to read. It starts by saying that when a boy aged 10 gets into the 10-year gymnasium, he's at least moderately intelligent, he can develop in various directions, but after eight years, when he gets his abiturat and comes out, <clears throat> what has he learned? <clears throat> a single thing, to bow for authority. And that was absolutely true. That was what the gymnasium was all about. And uh, uh, he also said that a reform is needed. A big pile should be made of all the books taught in the gymnasium and should be put on fire. And if the teachers cannot be put on fire for legal reasons, then at least two thirds of them should be fired and then we can speak about education in the country. Chairman politely thanked the distinguished guest for his views with which probably very few people would agree. Now, many years later, <clears throat> then came the war, and of course, uh, uh, all that mattered to us was survival, and uh, I, I only got from the war the absolute determination to leave the country forever as soon as possible. And the opportunity came in 47 when I came to Sweden. And then three years later in 50, my boss, Turban Kasperson, a famous cell biologist at the time, sent me to America on a stipend for half a year. <clears throat> uh, I call the experience in America in a, an autobiographical book I've written, The Statue of Liberty. After the feudal Hungarian University and the, at that time, semi-feudal Swedish University, to come to a country where I could make the greatest authority in a field, listen to me, who was nobody and from nowhere and had no degree, depended not on who I was and what my background was, but what I said. And this was a totally new experience, and that was totally liberating. The first poison I would want to mention that used to, um, to poison science was hierarchy. And of course the major centers were developed, or the nuclei in the centers, like the MRC lab in Cambridge, <clears throat> like the famous trio of the Pasteur Institute. 
like Woods Hall, uh, was that there was no hierarchy in communications. Now, is this still a problem today? Not so very much. It has not disappeared. Hierarchy is in human sociology, it will never disappear. But it can be modified. And Israel is an interesting example because the science was brought in from Europe, <clears throat> from some very hierarchical universities, German and other, Russian. <clears throat> but yet, the hierarchy is very mild in Israel because there is something that overrides all hierarchies and that's problem focusing, the tradition of learning, the belief in rationality, that will lift everything. And um, my wife Eva and I, we had a very direct experience of this because for 20 years <coughs> we have been organizing a small conference in Ein Gedi on the Dead Sea in a kibbutz and uh, it was called uh, the Maimonides Conferences in Cancer Research. We invited 20 Israelis, it was usually, it was always from a single small topic, but a topic that was exciting at the time, and 30 foreign guests, and we went on talking for three days, and then there was an open day to which all the Israeli biological community was invited. Now, uh, choosing the participants, we often chose people involved in bitter controversy, in jealousy, not speaking to each other for years. But the atmosphere of Ein Gedi is something very special. You go to the lectures uh, not in a hotel, not in a big city, but among the houses of the kibbutzniks, children playing, flowers flowering, women taking care of the laundry, it is life itself. And then the topics were exciting, and somehow, suddenly, competition and jealousy lifted, like a, as if like a stone disappears in the water. Only to be re-established, of course, after the meeting again. But still, there was something in this meeting, a collective euphoria, the joy to be able to focus on the problem itself, which was always marvelous. Uh, my mentor in America was Jack Schultz. Jack Schultz was a Drosophila geneticist, and he was the last student of the Morgan School. At one point he was interviewed, and the interviewer asked how could Morgan organize this incredible fly room which he organized at Columbia University where he developed Drosophila genetics. And in that room there were some incredibly gifted students who became later the leaders of the field, like Bridges, Strutterband, A.G. Muller, who got the Nobel Prize. Extremely ambitious, brilliant youngsters, crowded into a small room with the flies. How could they agree? How, how, how was it that it did not become conflict? How, can, who, how could he organize this marvelous collaboration? The basic achievements of Drosophila genetics, the map of the giant chromosomes, which are still, still used today. So Schultz opened big eyes and said, organize. Morgan never organized anything. We all knew that there was a work to do and we were all terribly excited about it. And I think that's the most important answer. But what are the modern and the postmodern poisons? I think they are quite different. First of all, there is the incredible precision in biology due to modern gene technology. There is an enormous amount of information generated, much more than can be digested. There is an incredible complexity, and uh, one is first overawed by complexity, unless you do like Tom, like uh, Boson in Canada said, that we biologists not only have to accept complexity, we have to love complexity. But in all the complexity, there are papers appearing in Nature and in Science, authored by, authored by 50 people, if not more. And what does the individual young scientist do? How does he establish a reputation, as a name? Everybody is asking for his originality, and yet he is desperate in trying to analyze uh, what is at hand. How does he achieve a reputation? <clears throat> there is a tyranny of the impact factor. 
as it was mentioned by several speakers here. How do you adapt to the impact factor? <clears throat> and there is now the custom developing more and more that uh, when young people are applying for grants or fellowships, they will write not only in the publication list and the journals, but they will also put down the impact factor. And my students come to me and say that, no, I won't send my paper to this journal because the impact factor is 5.2 and not 5.5. And what is that is responsible for the impact factor? <coughs> Very often, using the same methods as everybody else and uh, uh, essentially doing similar things as everybody else and coming to conclusions that are more or less expected, with great exceptions, of course. But still, there is this tendency. The tendency for conformity. The rest, the, the tendency to generate the data by all the established methods. The difficulty of finding or daring new approaches. <clears throat> when Barbara McClintock, uh, whom some people called the Mendel of the 20th century, got the Nobel Prize in medicine, for, she was a botanist, and she did genetics of the maize plant all her life, discovered the jumping genes. Uh, she was a genius, but for many, many years totally disregarded and misunderstood. Then she participated in that roundtable session on Swedish television, which they have every year during Nobel Week, and um, it is usually led by a, a very gifted and knowledgeable interviewer. <coughs> Uh, who, however, as, is asking the questions he thinks the public wants to know. Today it would be about stem cells, or, uh, the, or the environment, or global warming, or something like that. These are topics that the laureates usually know absolutely nothing about. But since they are in a euphoric mood, and on television and friendly, and it's all wonderful and marvelous, they will give answers which are sometimes completely nonsensical. It goes on for an hour. Barbara McClintock sat there with her eyes half closed and didn't ask any questions, didn't say anything at all. So finally the interview looks at her and says, Dr. McClintock, how did science change since you were a student? And she suddenly opened her eyes wide open, looked straight into the camera and said, where have all the biologists gone? I think that was a very appropriate remark. What the spirit of biology was is perhaps only in some places. I think it's alive, yes, but in very few places. Now, what did it mean? I don't think anyone described it better than François Jacob, who passed away just a few weeks ago. And uh, he described the atmosphere at the Pasteur Institute when the famous and finally Nobel Prize winning trio, André Lebov, Jacob Monod and François Jacob were active. Three extremely different personalities, 10 years apart in age, 10 and 10, <coughs> and yet a marvelous team together. What Jacob describes in his autobiography, which is a wonderful book, he's called La Statue Interieure, uh, what he describes is an atmosphere uh, very much imprinted by the many colorful Americans. The continuous seminars where everybody was actor and spectator at the same time. The uninterrupted firework of ideas and personalities. Tense duels and relaxed evenings with a glass of beer. A discussion that bounced back and forth between science and the theater. Bacteria and the music of Bach. It was a completely different work from the one you, one usually imagines as the cold, artificial, and somewhat boring environment of a laboratory. This was the world of curiosity and fantasy, continuously replenished by the joy of the unexpected. It could activate the deepest passions and the coolest logic at the same time. There was a continuous competition for intellectual dominance. The relations were complicated like at the royal court, with Monod as the undisputed emperor. But it was not worse than the youngest and the greenest students could get their life's chance. The personal situation of François Jacob was exactly this. 
He was the youngest and the greenest, uh, who had a very difficult use, a, a very dangerous uh, war experience when he died recently. He was the last companion de la liberación of the Gaulle who died. He was one of the most highly decorated soldiers, which he also describes. And he was not admitted by Lvov for five years. Every year he went to ask for a place in the lab and was refused. But finally, when he was admitted, he got a chance, so he went straight to the Nobel Prize. Uh, is this atmosphere still alive? I think uh, perhaps last representative is Sidney Brenner. Sidney Brenner, who is a South African Jew from the beginning, but who also won the Nobel Prize, although he said that they gave him the prize 30 years too late and for the wrong discovery, but that doesn't matter here. He is uh, still the most wonderful spirits and inspirers in all science. And he will tell you the most complicated things in a story or in a joke. Uh, Jacob wrote a marvelous <coughs> essay called Evolution and Tinkering, where he describes evolution not as an engineer who uh, works according to a plan, but a tinkerer, like a boy building an amateur radio and taking all the pieces together that he can find, useless pieces, but he can put them together to something that works. So the New York Times interviewed Sidney Brenner some time ago, and they said to him, was it an interesting experience to share a room uh, in Cambridge with Francis Crick for 20 years? So Sidney Brenner said it was very, very interesting. So why? Because Francis had the habit of writing down on a writing pad any questions or ideas that occurred to him during the day. And Sidney, as soon as Francis was out of the room, and looked at it to see what the idea of the day was. So give us an example, the interviewer said. So Sidney said, one day Francis wrote, only God knows how imaginal discs work. Now, you know what imaginal discs are. Uh, they are the very amorphous, structureless discs. All the larvae of the insects have a certain number, a certain distance, a certain size, absolutely constant for a given species. And these discs have no known function in the larva. They are to totally inactive. But when the larva pupates and breaks down most of its tissues by apoptosis, then suddenly the imago, the fly or the butterfly, uh, develops from the imaginal discs uh, absolutely marvelous in a very short time. So why was this so interesting, the interviewer says? Well, Sidney Brenner says, that night I had a dream. Crick died, went up to heaven, was received by St. Peter. And uh, he says to St. Peter, I would like to meet God because I have a question. So St. Peter says to him, well, that can be arranged. And he leads Crick down through a very large complex of shabby laboratory buildings where people are furiously working away at the bench. And in the last little room in a small building, there is a little old man with suspenders, bald-headed, who is working at the bench. So St. Peter says, Dr. Crick, this is God. God, this is Dr. Crick. He wants to ask you a question. He wants to ask you a question. Go ahead and make it quick. So Francis says, how do imaginal discs work? So the little old man scrapes his head and looks confused and then he says, to tell you the truth, I really don't know. I just know that I added a little thing here, I added a little thing there, I put a, gave something here, I took gave something there. Fact is, I've been making flies for 300 million years and so far no one complained. <laughs> So, can you explain to the lay public tinkering better than that, so that they will remember it? And this is just one example. Wherever he is, wherever he comes, uh, he, he has something to say. Last time in Stockholm, he gave a lecture. He never uses slides. And uh, he saw me coming in at the other end of the room. He says, look, George, I'm cured. He had cancer. My hair has grown out. I have another 30 years to go. And then he gave a lecture saying that the year 2053 is approaching. And that will be the anniversary, the 100th anniversary of double helix. 
And I, as a molecular biologist, will no doubt get a major task. And I think my task will be to describe the gene sequence of a centaur. And then came an absolutely brilliant expose, which I cannot describe to you, explaining the centaur, the double digestive apparatus, the lungs and so on, and how would one write down the gene sequence. That was and is Sidney Brenner. Nowadays, I, whenever I'm invited to some place I don't know, it may be a university, and I have to give a talk. And perhaps before a the talk there is a cocktail party, and everybody's asking the standard questions, how are you, how is your wife, how is the weather in Stockholm, and so on. And nobody's interested in your answer. Uh, what they are interested in is in to talk to their colleagues, and who is there, and they look above your shoulder. And I have the habit of not listening to the questions, because I know it's always the same. I try to listen to what the local people speak about. And um, uh, they, do they speak about something that is something to speak about? Do they speak about a scientific problem, or a book they have read, or a theatre piece they have seen? Uh, and if they do, 50-50. The other 50 being the, the grant seeking, secret bragging about uh, papers published in Nature and Science, or about students received, or about the trivialities of life. If it's 50-50, I know I'm in one of the best places in the world. If it's 100 to 0, as it usually is, then I know I'm in the usual place. So, will the spirit of creativity prevail in science? I don't really know. I don't, don't think anyone can tell. But I think leaders like Alex, with his polite but relentless persistence for the right values, will be the ones who will make leaders further, and maybe scientific culture will survive, perhaps just as Jewish culture survived in Yavne. Thank you very much. Let me just make one statement. To describe the legacy of Alex, let me quote from Albert Einstein, who stated in 1928, I think it was in Zurich, and Einstein said, it is not only the character, it's not only the talent that makes a scientist, it is mainly the character. And this is what we all cherish. We miss Alex. Well, actually, with this, we end the two days, hectic days here. We didn't have a chance to thank the staff of uh, the academy. We were too busy to do it, but uh, it's about time. And uh, with this, I can almost cite the names of all the staff. And I'll start with Shelley, who was his secretary and worked for him. Avital. <laughs> Avital, Yael, Kochi, Sima, Yaakov, maybe is here. And special thanks to Dr. Dudu Friedman, who was behind the scene. And of course, everything was done with cooperation with the Planning and Grounds Committee. Dr. Liat Maoz is sitting there quietly. But she and Noah did really a great contribution behind the scenes and on the scenes. And it's a real thanks for all the road we went together from last year when we first met at uh, Alex's house when he was still with us. Thank you, and hope to see you in two years' time when we have the next uh, science policy exercise and workshop. Thank you. <laughs>